Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 I greet the church again in the mighty name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. On a Friday night, all night. Amen. Um, we may be seated. For some of us, this might be our first time. For some of us, our second time. For some of us, it's a lifestyle. But whatever it is, we need each other to survive tonight. If you see somebody's eyes closing involuntarily, go to them, nudge them. Amen. Let them know that I am here. Let's wake up. Let's do the things that we are here for. Amen. So there's a woman of God who's been mentoring me through her sermons, and she does a whole lot of um, all-night prayers, you know. And every time she's praying and she sees someone praying, she's rebuking that eye. She said, Pastor, I know you don't have sexy eyes, but your eyes seems like they are drowsy. So whoever's next to that pastor, like, punch them, you know. So I am saying to you that tonight might be a little bit difficult for some of us physiologically because we might not be used to it, but the Lord is here. Your brothers and sisters are here. So when you are being nudged to wake up, you know, um, it's love so that you can stay in the race until the end. Amen? Amen. As I said, we need each other to survive. We're in this together. Amen. <laughs> um, I just want to maybe make a few comments about prayer. You know, prayer is something that in our generation can sometimes be reduced to a conversation that you have with God. And I say this because we live in a generation that sometimes has trivialized things and made even our Christianity casual, you know. And prayer is not that, Banabamurana. When you grow and you mature in the Lord, you know, sometimes we are so rigid that even Jesus himself has to respect your schedule. He knows your prayer is 30 minutes. He helps you with your to-do list, but after that, you know, there's nothing else. But prayer is not like that. And I've been to, you know, places and ministries where prayer is not really a thing. You know, there are other things that take precedent. But prayer is something that, you know, as Muruti Mpo has said, that was patterned by our master. And when he prayed all night, you know, we do what he has done because he's the pattern man of our faith. So as we are here, you must know that you are here engaging with God. And as I say, prayer is not casual. Prayer is not just the conversation where you know God, this is. And you know, we have that. Jesus is my homeboy attitude. Those are some of the things that we find in our generation. Ne? But when you grow, and I've been having this conversation with my label on and off, you get to know that God is a judge. And as he's using a generation now, things are changing. He's no longer just a loving father who wants to hold you, but he's a judge who must make sure that, you de that the demands of righteousness are fulfilled in your life so that you can be used and advance the kingdom. When Jesus was on the cross and he was uh, saying, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? That was prayer. Prayer is painful consecration. Prayer is submission. Prayer is warfare. Prayer is coming to fight for destiny and taking it, you know. And I think it's Bill Johnson who says that destiny is not something that is a given. You must go and take it. God declares it, but he gives you the power to go and take it. So I want us to carry that militant attitude as we step into prayer. To say that we are here to trade with heaven. You know, as Muruti Mpo said, that our words, we are here to speak words of life. When Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. It means that they have the power to produce, to do something, to create, to give life. And as he said, one word can carry you 10 years. I'm evidence of that. Ne? So as we have come here to pray, you are here to speak to a holy being. Humans need spirits to survive. Now, where that spirit comes from, you decide. 
but humans need spirits to survive. You can't prosecute this life with accuracy and precision and really achieve the purposes of God without a spirit. And as we come here, we are here standing in the gap. You know, intercession, um, intercession and repent. Those are the two misused words in the church. You know, they've been uh, used to the place where they might even be meaningless. But in the, if you read Isaiah 58 and you read what truly intercession is, prayer is the lowest in the cadre of intercession. Prayer is actually you engaging culture and taking back the wrath of God from a generation so that the kindness of God can prevail. So you are here to be empowered through prayer, but so that you can go back to a place where you, you are the person that ushers in the kindness of God. Amen. So prayer is actually not intercession, but it's part of intercession. If you read Isaiah 58, as I say, you will see that that is intercession. Yeah? But I just wanted us to carry that mind when we step into prayer. We'll come into the word of the day. Um, the media team, I'm going to rely on you heavily for the scriptures today. Um, we're going to read Psalms 22. Let me try find it here. Psalms 22. Um, Psalms 22, verse 32 to 32. And we're going to speak about a generation. What is a generation? You know, we like to speak about these words and, you know, but without understanding in terms of what a, when God refers to a generation, what does he really mean? And as we stand here, how far should we go? But maybe let me say this as disclaimers, that we are the end time generation. We are the finishing generation. The thing that God is doing has already started a long time ago. We are just the generation that is receiving the baton so that we can finish well. And even you cannot even conceive the harvest that the Lord is expecting from you. Because this is the generation that will bring God the most harvest, I believe. That will give him the greatest amount of impact in the shortest possible time. So can you imagine the investment that has been made upon you? Amen. So think about that, that there's a divine performance that God is expecting of you because of those who have gone ahead of you. And even though we live in a dark time and we look at this, God knew that you would be living in this generation. LGBTQI++, the madness continues, you will be living in that generation. And that you will be the answer to that generation. So I want you to carry the mind that I am the preferred choice to bring the solutions of God in this generation. Amen. We cannot live in fear. We cannot look at the darkness. I mean, you know, with every child that is born, I keep hearing. I mean, my brother is like, Godly. Can you see how this world is, you know? And I mean, I get where the heart is coming from. But mine is to say that God has even made them solutions for the darkness that is coming. And the Bible says that we carry a light that darkness cannot comprehend. So if we come to the place of prayer and we are coming to contact God, we must know that he himself has a plan for our generation. There's no way that we can be born in such a time and we must live intimidated, live in hiding, live as those who draw back to perdition. God would not do that. He's looking for us to be bold. In fact, if anything, he's looking for those who will confront the generation and say these are the purposes of God in our time. Amen. So that's what we'll be speaking about. We'll be speaking about the generation that must and that one of the prophetic requirements of this time for the church, you cannot be afraid of the world. If anything, you must go into the world. No? So we cannot be a people that hide in these walls. We cannot just be here and our religious expressions and our religious consciences are satisfied. We speak in big, bold, capital letters, tongues, but there's no expression to the purposes of God when we step outside. So places like this are places where you must be empowered to make sure that the purposes of God are preserved, number one, and are fulfilled out there. Amen. 
So um, Psalms 22, verse 30 to 32. The posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. 32. There's no 32. Okay. So in another version, it says the seed. Let's go back to verse 30. It says, the seed shall serve him. You, I don't know who has that version, but it speaks about the seed. This one says, the posterity ne? shall serve him. And that seed will be counted of the Lord to a generation. So that seed will be counted to the Lord to a generation. 31. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who the seed... And that seed is a generation that will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. Amen. Let's read Acts chapter 13 verse 36. Acts 13. Acts 13 36. For David, after he had served his own generation, it's speaking about a man, but it's speaking about a generation at the same time. By the will of God, fell on, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Ne? It says when David had served the purposes of God in his generation, he fell asleep and the body saw corruption. Let's read Psalms, um, Psalms 24. Let me try to find it here because it's a bit of a lengthy read. Psalms 24, I'll read the entire um, psalm. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation and on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb? We'll read the scripture again. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, um, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have the right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship, and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient of you ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord enclaved in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. Can I please have um, verse, uh, from verse 3 to 6 in the King James Version or NKJV. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to idols, some say to vanity or sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob. Jacob. The generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face. Selah. Amen. When God is looking to impact a generation. He looks for a person. He doesn't look for a generation. He doesn't need the multitude. He doesn't need numbers. He needs a person. We have read in the scripture here, the first one, it said, the seed shall account, shall be accounted for a generation. It speaks about Jacob here. It is speaking about a generation. So God's method in a generation it is always a man, is always a human being. So you are a human being that can be a seed of something in your generation. 
And you need to carry that mind that I am someone who can, who can be a seed for my generation and bring in the, the fulfillment of whatever God wants to achieve in that generation. Amen. When God wanted to deliver the children of Israel, he sent Moses, a man, a seed. When God wanted to deliver the children of Israel, again, or let me say, not even the children of Israel, when he wanted to save the world and make Egypt the breadbasket, he sent Joseph, a man who became a seed. When God wanted to, live, to deliver you, he sent Jesus, a seed. Amen. So God's method is still a man. And when God counts generations, he doesn't count people, multitudes. He counts a man. There's something in your generation that you are meant to fulfill. And you know what the Lord says? He says, David served the purposes of God in his generation. Therefore, that generation is then counted among those who served God. Not that they all served God. But David served the purposes of God. So it is possible for you to be an answer in a generation that can be counted in the purposes of God. Amen. Can you see how powerful God is? You know, in, when, in, in, when we start businesses, what do we need? We need, people always say capital, like people when you ask them all the time. It's not about a plan. It's not a strategy. It's not, it's money. I need money. No? Money is currency. It's something that must bring about a flow. In the world, the currency is money, okay? It's dollars, it's whatever. And uh, the higher currency or the lower currency always serves the higher currency. That's why the, you know, the rand dollar exchange and so forth. And you find nations who, whose currencies become redundant and they end up using the higher currency, ne? So that is the world's way, heaven's way, you are currency. When God wants to uh, start something, he sows gawena. You are the currency that God releases. Amen. So I want us to carry that mind that I am the currency that God is releasing for my generation. And having that in mind, I want us to read, we don't have to read it, but you can note it. Um, Proverbs uh, 23, verse 10, it says, it speaks about the ancient landmarks, that we cannot remove the ancient landmarks. And what I'm saying to you with that scripture is that God's method has always been a man and it will, it will never change. It will always be a man that is an answer to the purposes of God in a generation. Let's read Ezekiel 22. We're going to read 25 to 29 or 30. Ezekiel 22. And this scripture is speaking about a generation. And I want you to know that the things that we are seeing now, you know, the fear, the, the things that bring about the fear that make the hearts of men to fail, they have been there before. You know, when the Bible says, speaks about the wiles of the enemy, his methods, Lena, his methods have not changed. The same way that God uses a man, he also uses men, you know. But God is more powerful. You know, one thing the enemy is not, the Bible never says the enemy is powerless. Have you noticed that? It, it doesn't say that. And you must not make the mistake of saying that he's powerless too. But the Bible assures us that our God is greater. The Bible assures us, you know, I was um, speaking to a young man yesterday and he was making so many confessions and I could feel like he was just, you know, in a place of condemnation. And I was trying to speak life to him to say, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to because every time he's like, Pastor Kat, I deliver people from this spirit, but it attacks me and I can feel it and I can feel it. So how do I become a minister that delivers people, but yet I struggle from the same thing? You know, all the Holy Spirit was saying that the grace of God is stronger than that spirit. The grace of God is stronger and more powerful. You know, you keep showing up and the righteousness of God and the seed of righteousness of the righteousness of God will be nurtured in you. 
Amen. Ezekiel 22 verse 25 says, There is a conspiracy of her, prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have, profa have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profane among them. Her princes, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, rave, re revening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to shed dishonest gain. And her prophets have, du have duped them with untempered, with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not said. This is our generation. Prophets saying, thus says the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. Next. Verse 30. Oh, there's no 30. Oh, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Xenophobia. And I sought for a man in that mess. The Lord is saying, I sought for a man. Ne? And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the, for the land that I should destroy it. But I found none. God did not even look outside. He didn't look for angelic beings. He sought for a man among them. So when we come to places like this, when we come to prayer, we must know that God himself is seeking a man among us for this generation. As it is, with all the ills that you have read over there, he is saying for one who can stand in the gap that his wrath might relent and that he might not destroy the place. We see it with Abraham who was a friend of God. God was willing to enter into negotiations to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the friendship that God had with Abraham, a man. So God is seeking a man. The prayer today is that I'm that man, I'm that woman. God, make me that man, make me that woman. Amen. And as I said, remember I said prayer is painful consecration. Prayer is submission. Prayer is warfare. So in a generation that would not have you be that man, you are here to claim that place and say that I am that man. Amen. I'm now going to read um, some of the scriptures that we read on Sunday um, about being that man. You know, uh, Papa was teaching us about the faithful high priest. I'm still camping on that message. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Hebrews 4 verse 15. Being that man means that you are called to a place of priesthood. As I said, that poverty is not a social construct. Poverty has an altar and a priesthood that ensures that people stay in that place. Can you see there's a generation where like in a family, it can be poor man after poor man after poor man after poor man. They leave nothing for a generation. Are you telling me that there's no one who was a uh, clever nyana enough to rise and to? No, there's something that makes sure that people stay in that place. Amen. So if we are to engage culture and be that man and be that woman, you're not going to do it without priesthood. Even if you go to Harvard, even if you go to Oxford, there's a university older than Harvard, older than Oxford, that has made sure that certain things stay in place and your certificate means nothing if you are not baptized in the thing that makes spirits bow. Amen. 
And that's the thing about our generation. We have so been trained, especially with the issues of apostles in the marketplace. I mean, you know, when, when we got into the faith, as I was being discipled in my time in varsity, you know, at his people, apostles in the marketplace was a new thing. So when you graduated, there was a course that you took to help you be an apostle in the marketplace. But it was not a course, and I'm with all due respect, I get it we have advanced. So at that time, it served its purpose. So it helped me be somebody who wants to advance the kingdom in Babylon, but at the same time, not understand what keeps me a Daniel in Babylon. What keeps me from the place of not being contaminated by Babylon, even though I'm carrying Zion, you know? So we have this apostles in the marketplace, the people that write the checks and the you know, the little brother of the apostle in the marketplace is the kingdom financiers. I'm a kingdom financier. So they don't come to whole night prayers. They don't do the things that we do. They just write the checks and let church continue. Let the gospel advance. In this day and age, there's no time for that. God is looking for king priests. So while you are being an apostle in the marketplace, you are at the whole night prayer with your knees between your knees, you know, praying that the purposes of God prevail. While you write that policy there to change the government's ideas about things, you are praying under your breath that that policy must be empowered by the spirit because they have a spirit that is empowering that very policy. You know, I worked at the NYDA for a very short season for six months. And we were working on uh, a report called the Integrated Youth Development Report. So this is the government's uh, idea of how to empower the youth. And they had different pillars. My pillar was specific job creation, entrepreneurship, and yeah, economic development, socioeconomic issues around the youth. And if the NYDA is a standard for our nation, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. In the knowledge management unit that I worked in, I wasn't a senior, I had supervisors, and I was happy to be supervised and not to supervise. In the unit that I worked in, 80% of the people there, Kirisangora, 80% of them, it's like gods are fighting. Like even when you come in, and I remember going there and me being me, you know, the jewel of God, who's always looking to advance the kingdom. You know, I'm thinking, God, who am I going to, you know, who am I going to harvest for the kingdom here? This was on my third day when I was there. I had a dream. And the Holy Spirit said in the dream, God, these people are dead bodies. There's no one to raise over here. It's dead bodies and they're decaying. Serve your time and go. Don't even think about a future here. I'm here to show you the state of the nation, that this is the body that is ruling the youth, the government. Remember, this is the body that is releasing policy about the youth. Ne? And you know what they do there? They fund organizations. They call it the NEAT group, the non-educated, the non um, I can't remember what the acronym really means, ne? but they'll never fund you if you are capable of handling money. They won't. They are looking specifically for people that can handle money so that the money goes down the drain. And, but they, they account for saying that we have funded. That's an, organiza an organization with no conscience and no mandate. Its mandate is do the job, but don't empower. Make sure that people get what they get, but don't empower. So they are looking for you who has not gone to varsity. The moment you have a university degree, they won't fund you in a certain way. You are last on the list. They had, during COVID, there was a campaign that they had 100 businesses in 100 days. They funded 100 businesses in 100 days. 100% ne? of those businesses failed. Yet there was funding. So I'm here to tell you there's money that can be released to you and never take you anywhere. Its mandate is to keep you in that place. Ne? Even if, have you, have you seen, and fortunately, you know, the Lord has blessed me enough to work in 
um, organizations where I work with a lot of young people. So I hardly find myself, or yeah, hardly find myself with a lot of um, elders, you know, which I feel we, we need. And that's what is lacking, you know, the wisdom of the old and the, the strength of the youth to come together to actually advance society. And in places where I work, you find, you know, young girls, Banalidi Blesa and so forth. Ne? Have you noticed the money will never establish them? It will never take them, it will never education, it will never buy a house for their parents, it will never take their child, their siblings to school, but it will buy a Gucci bag. It will even buy a BMW if you will. But it will never do the thing that brings about establishment. So money itself is a spirit that carries intention. I personally do not believe in state money at all, especially because of what I've been exposed. You know, the Sasa, the grants, they will never take you anywhere. Its intention is for you to survive in poverty comfortably. When you are receiving that, just take it back. Just take it back. You know, and that is the revelation that I have. And this is what God is calling us to. If you are called to government and called to social development, social development must develop. But there are intentions that it doesn't develop. I'm reading a paper by um, uh, Dr. Mohoti, Giratile Mohoti, who's written a book about the quality of philanthropy in the continent. So she writes that Philanthropy, you know, we have a lot of foundations, especially in Africa. Ne? We have a lot of the Mozipe Foundation. We have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They are here doing some work. Like, we have a lot of foundations. But have you noticed that development is not advancing? As much as we as people are growing and whatever, but we're advancing in the same circumstances. And people, if they look like they're advancing, do you know that 98% of the people in this area, in the East, in Moikloof, in Wood Hill, and all of them are broke. Broke. So they are financing a life that they actually cannot maintain. Those are the stats in South Africa. That's the reality. So when you are looking and you are admiring, we billets are If it is not God who says you are going there, you are calling something upon yourself that you cannot even maintain. Ne? So, in our generation, the stats are hectic, even in the church. You know, um, we work with a company called Worth, and I'm praying, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing these things to your attention, because this is the state of our world. You guys are being, you know, nurtured and mentored, you are studying, but be nurtured and mentored in the things of the spirit as well. So that as you go out there, you'll actually carry the power to change things. Because there's a system that is designed for you to conform. That is designed to make you look exactly the same as the system. Ne? We work with a company called Worth. Worth is... Um, they work with money, they teach financial literacy. And then Worth has, is the one who actually helped Discovery Bank become established. So they are the minds behind Discovery Bank and everything that you see. But the beauty about it, and it's a Jewish guy, a Jewish man, the beauty about it that he's passionate about financial literacy with what you have. He's not necessarily trying to make you run for the millions, but he's trying to say, with what you have, how can you multiply it? How can I teach you to multiply it and to live with what you have? A good life, improving the quality of your life, but multiplying it. This guy was giving us stories to say that he is called by executives, Ko Anglo, Samanko, in the mining spaces. Those guys whose um, annum, you know, per annum salaries are like 3.5 million and so forth. He's being called to come and rehabilitate those guys because they are in debt. They are broke. The bank is about to take the car. The bank is about to take the house. The bank is about to take things. And the mine, the CEO is saying, I can't afford to lose this guy. He's got the IP of the mine. So come and rehabilitate him and make sure that he doesn't leave. Because if they liquidate him, he won't be able to maintain this job and stay here. Those are the interventions that are taking place. And that man is like an Abraham. 
He's like a Joseph. He's like an Ansa in this generation doing exactly that. And that is the work of the church. That is what we are being called to. So the first thing I would like to say is that as we decide to be answers in a generation, let's decide to build according to God's plan in the way that God will be, will, would build. Because if we don't build according to pattern, everything we build will be consumed by the fire. And you don't want to build and climb up the ladder only to find out that the ladder is, you know, it's, it's leaning against the wrong wall. You've actually climbed to the wrong place. So we come to places like this to receive the blue pattern of God, the blueprint, to receive the master plan, to receive direction, to receive the purpose for my life. There's no more cut and, king, cut and paste, control V, control C. We can't do that in Christianity. And the thing is, you know, the, 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 the weakness of our church or the weakness of the faith or religion, let me put it that way. The moment I know that I am called and, you know, God has called me for something. And I was saying, I spoke about this, I think two weeks ago in prayer. When God has called me, the first thing I want to do is give the calling a name. House of Deborah Ministries. Ne? And what do you then do? You want to create a logo. After creating a logo, you know, and that's the challenge. We do that and we haven't heard God. The call is only an invitation to the place that prepares you for what he's calling you to. What God is asking for you in that moment is your yes. You don't know how the ministry looks like. And the thing is, we have so many ministries that look the same. We look at what Pastor Cat is doing. That looks good. But good is not God. And it's possible for you to do good, but miss out on God. So let us decide to follow the pattern that God will give and to pay the price to receive the pattern. Spiritual knowledge is not cheap. It's not cheap. You are not going to go to one place of prayer and God must speak. Uh, is not Sangoma is not a spirit that was one of Sangoma. He is not summoned. You don't just summon him and he just speaks and then he gives you answers. You, he's a king spirit. You wait upon him. He doesn't come and then you know he must just speak. Do you understand? And we live in that generation. I get it. We live in a generation where we go pay for spiritual knowledge. You didn't pay the price. Ne? You didn't pay the price for it. And that's why we don't value it. You receive prophetic words, but you don't go to pay the price to lambano the prophetic word in you to make sure that you can conceive it and it becomes a word. So Murutim Po gave you a word four years ago that you are called for nations. You are still here. You still believe you are called for nations, but you haven't conceived the word. He is not believing for you. He was just a, 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 a channel for the word. But you must go, and if you are called for nations, go buy a map. Put the map on the floor. Pray over them. You know, start exercising the call. Because God has called you for nations. And that's what we do. We don't want to pay the price for spiritual knowledge. But yet we want things to come to pass. When Tabiso gives you a word, he has paid a price to hear God in that way. You haven't. Now you must go for God to affirm that which he is confirming. Amen. So we are here for that. If we are saying we are called for a generation, we say, Lord, we want your pattern for me. Your pattern for my generation. Your pattern for my family. You are an answer in your family. There are certain things that will never break until you rise and answer the call of God for certain things in your lineage, in your family. But the pattern man of God is, must be released to you in the place of prayer. Amen. So it doesn't matter how you live here, but don't leave without receiving something. Even if it's an instruction to keep waiting upon him, it's still something. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, I'll be quick and then we'll step into the place of prayer. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You are empowered to be a high priest by the pattern man Christ himself 
who's the chief high priest, who sympathizes with all forms of our weaknesses, but still continues to call us to come up higher. Amen. So whatever you are answering is going to need priesthood to stand. Even now, Christ is still a high priest. Even now. Can you imagine he, how long ago whatever Calvary happened, but still he guards that through priesthood. So even you, when you say yes to the call, there's a priesthood that you must answer. And there's a priesthood that you must guard to make sure that the purposes of God are fulfilled. Let's read another scripture. John chapter 4 verse 38. It says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labors. I believe that we are stepping into a time where there's a maturation of mentals. Mature mentals are falling upon the young. So even if, you know, when uh, that scripture that says, Paul, we know, Jesus, we know, who are you? Coming with a mental, you will be known. Coming on your own, you won't be known. You are, you are, you are probably, you haven't paid the price. But God is releasing mental because he must fast track his work. So the Elijah mental is available in the spirit for you. And there are certain things that don't know you, but they know Elijah. There are certain problems that don't know you, but they know Elijah and his solutions. So we must rise to be people who want those mentals, the Deborah mental, the Esther mental. And I just want to say something to the young ladies. You know, something that has been in my spirit. Numbers chapter 6, the daughters of Zelophehad. You know, the ones who cried for their father's inheritance. I believe, you know, we see this uh, woman empowerment movement. I believe it's not a, a, a movement by women or feminism. It's a movement by God himself. He himself is advancing women. And for the purposes of the bride to be empowered to rise. No? And you know those daughters of Zelophehad, they remember their father died and they said that they couldn't inherit. And they, he, they couldn't inherit because they were, not, they were not boys, you know. And they then went to the priest and the priest said, no, it is divine order. You do not stand to inherit. And they went then to Moses and they said, Moses, he was, you know, our father has died and we are his seed and he was our progenitor. So we stand to inherit. And you know what Moses said to the priests when he answered? He said, it is not divine order, it is tradition. So give them what belongs to them. So they had the courage to challenge tradition and then they were able to receive their inheritance. I'm saying to you, that there are certain things that you're going to have to challenge that are tradition, that look like they're divine order, but they're not. They are tradition. And if we do not challenge the status quo, you will remain without your, your, your inheritance. Another character in the Bible that I love so much is the daughter of Caleb, Aksa. We don't, you know, we don't talk about her that much, but she was someone who was given land and when she was given the land she asked for more and her father gave her more so she was able to step out of the places of saying no women don't inherit i'm not supposed to you know the father actually asked her will you marry this man because i need to give you to him i you know there was she was actually a prize for something that needed to be done for the father to the man who would do it who was her cousin and then it was done so he the father then said, would you marry him? Said, yes, I would marry him. And then the father said, what then shall I do for you? Because you have done the thing that I, I have asked you. And she said, give me that land. And the Bible, when it explains it, she asked for the land with the waterfalls, you know, with everything that was lush and green, where there was life. So she had the boldness to ask for the best and the father gave it to her. So prophetically, I'm saying, there are things that the Father will ask of you. And in doing them, your reward would be, what shall I do for you? The same thing with Esther. You know, when the king saw Esther, what do you want from me? Even half of my kingdom, I will give it to you. But you know what Esther did? She knew what the ask was for. She didn't use it for gain. She used it for the kingdom. 
to preserve a people. So there are certain things that the Lord will give, will come to you and ask. And in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, ask for the generation. Ask for the preservation of God's people. And you will never lose out. But ask for yourself. Even that kingdom, you will lose it tomorrow. And the purposes of God will still continue. But you will be lost. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 11 it says and it builds on the scripture of saying that we are stepping into places and mantles that we have not labored for and God is releasing those mantles. The standards have not changed to maintain those mantles. The standard remains the same but God is releasing them. It says um, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, walls you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when, then when you eat and are satisfied, meaning that there will be a place where God satisfies you, uh, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So slavery can be many things. It's a metaphor for many things. When the Lord has brought you out of something and you come to the place of satisfaction, be careful not to forget him. Be careful not to forget him. On the 13th of July, uh, I made a covenant with the Lord. And you know, it, he gave me this scripture at night. He woke me up and he gave me this scripture. And I have a serviette here that I carry around because I had nothing to write. And I wrote over here the seeds of righteousness that have been planted. So every time I read this, I'm reading the mantles that I step into because of those who have gone ahead of me. Those who are forerunners in the faith. I'm not talking about reverencing ancestors. I'm talking about those who have planted seeds of righteousness that have ensured my preservation, that I step in them, you know. And I, I read the scripture and I said, Lord, so if I'm stepping into places and I'm reaping things that I did not work for, the most important thing for me to know is what it is for. Why you would have me enter into that place. So I'm saying the same thing to you. Some of you are forerunners. Some of you are first generation Christians. Some of you are second generation Christians. Some of you, the mentals have accumulated. But wherever you are, God will meet you where you are. But if you are stepping into a place where those have, who have gone ahead of you are there, you need to understand why the Lord would have you complete the race. What is the expectation from you? in this harvest. Amen. I'm going to read um, the last two scriptures and then we are going to pray. Matthew 6 verse, Matthew 5 verse 6, it says, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Do you know that hunger is cultivated in the house of God? Hunger is something that you must protect. A child that does not eat, that's how we know a child is sick. A child who has no hunger. When we saw Horongwana wa Afola, you know, when we, the child is getting better, its appetite returns. When you are in the house of God and what you are reading here no longer has meaning to you. No longer, you don't even hunger for the experiences that you are reading about. Be worried. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Filling comes as a result of hunger and thirst. Amen. Isaiah 55 verse 1 to 2, it says, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? We have come here to buy what money cannot buy. We have come here to buy destiny, purpose, accuracy, blueprints, maps that we need for our time, for our generation. That's what we have come here for. So make up your mind to buy. It says come. The prerequisite is come. So you can be here, but you are not here. So I'm inviting you to come. 
because God is here. Amen. And in the coming, let our, heart, our hearts thirst and desire righteousness. Because, you know, yesterday the Holy Spirit said to me that misplaced desire stops or withholds the prov divine provision. When your desire is not aligned to the desire of God, divine provision is withheld. Until Hannah knew that heaven needed a prophet and I need a son, divine provision was released. So there are certain things that God is waiting for you to say, how does this benefit the kingdom so that he might release them to you? Amen. So when we are here, as much as we thirst and hunger for righteousness, we thirst and we hunger for greatness. And greatness, I mean, I mean, our core scripture, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus knew that the disciples wanted to be great men. I mean, we are reading fishermen who changed the world, not Harvard students. Fishermen wrote these books, you know. I mean, the most educated of them was Luke and Paul. But we are reading the words of fishermen, of those who were at their times, not necessarily intellectuals of their times. So greatness is in the heart of every man that encounters Christ. But it is possible for it to be contaminated and twisted and appropriated not in the right way. But our hunger and thirst for God will keep certain things in check so that even our greatness is aligned to the method and what God says is greatness for our time. Amen. So we are going to pray, Banabamurena, and those are our prayer points. I mean, I've mentioned a couple of things. Number one, say to the Lord, I'm that seed. I want to be counted for a generation. I want to fulfill the purposes of God in my lifetime. I want to make sure that a generation is counted because of me. Amen? Thank God. We are going to thank God for those who have gone ahead of us. As I said, that some of us, we are the answered prayer of our grandmothers. We are the seed of those who have gone ahead of us and planted that we might be. So we are going to thank God for the mantles that we are stepping into. That we do not have to labor for certain things, but yet we will carry the authority for certain things. Amen? And then we are going to say... In the places where we get those mantles, it is not about, you know, it's about being a seed in your generation like Christ. And it's not about being the anointed one. It's about the fruit. It's about consecration. It's about the fruit of Christ manifesting in your generation. Amen. So that's what we're going to pray for. That as we tap into Christ, who is the pattern man, who was the faithful high priest, whatever priesthood we need to uphold, let the fruit of his, let the fruit of Christ find manifest in our lives. And I keep saying this, and I love saying this, that Christ must receive the full reward of his suffering. The kingdoms of this world, you know, Christ didn't need anything that he died for. But he died for you to take it over for him. So through your life, he must receive the full reward of his suffering. Redemption must come to your family. Redemption must come to your community. And you know, redemption means things must be restored to what God intended them to be. Amen. Redemption must come to education. Redemption must come to government. Redemption must come to arts and culture. It must come. Amen. So as we are going to pray... Those are the aches in our heart that we are bringing to God. But allow him to speak whatever is the prayer point as well. Those are the things that we grasp that we can conceive right now. But he also has an ache for our generation. And let us, let us allow him to speak it unto us. You know, sometimes in the place of prayer, it's not so much that you have anything to say. But the Holy Spirit has called you that he might confide in you. And then guide the prayer point. So for some of us, it's going to be a time of listening more than actually praying. For some of us, it's actually going to be praying and declaring, you know, the things that God has spoken. But either way, it's the place of power where God is releasing power. Amen. Can we just stand and sing a worship song? Just one 